Hello, everybody. Welcome to Life Struggles. So what do you think? Is your life a struggle? Have you been conditioned to believe that life is a struggle? If you think it is, then this is what will unfold. And if you don't, it won't. But is it really that simple? I don't believe that it is, which is why I began this podcast. I think each and every one of us have different life struggles. But the biggest purpose here is to find someone that I can share with you that has possibly the same life struggle that you're going through and has conquered it. Because my belief is that there is an end to each and every one of your life struggles. It all depends on how you look at it. So this is what you're going to be hearing in life struggles. You're going to be hearing about cutting, about alcohol addiction, about drug addiction, about childhood traumas, about sex addictions, about mental health disorders, many of them, all different kinds of them, bipolar, ADD, any of those kind of disorders, you're going to find out that you are not alone and we are going to help lift each other up. The best thing that you can do is to share our podcast to someone that you know that can relate to whichever one you're listening to. So thank you for coming and please welcome our next guest. I'm taking just a brief moment to tell you about Anchor, which is the platform that I am using to record my podcast. Let me explain. First of all, it's free. And who doesn't want free? There are also certain tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your iPhone or computer. And Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more platforms. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. So please just download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started and have fun doing it. Just how willing are you to share some of the things in your life that you're not so proud of? One of the purposes of life struggles is for you to be able to not only come on as a guest, but as a listener so that you can see how many other people go through some of the same life struggles that you are. I want to thank my next guest, Jason who has been on my podcast before, but talking more about his addictions. And this time, Jason is going to share something very important to all of us parents with the red flags to look for in your child who is going through puberty. And in this episode, Jason talks about cutting. Please help me welcome Jason. Hi, I have Jason Lachance here with me. And today, Jason's going to share with us a time in his life where he used cutting. And that is for a emotional kind of like an addiction, like covering something, pain, some kind of pain, trauma up, right? Absolutely. You nailed it, Christy. Good to see you. Thank you. It's good to see you too. So 
why don't we just dive right in and you tell me like when it started, why it started, what you went through. Yeah, well, it, it, you know, of course, um, you know, previous episode of people I haven't heard, go back and listen with uh, Chrissy talking about uh, my alcoholism and um, really spawning, as you said, from trauma, mm-hmm. uh, sexually abused at a young age, grew up in the home of addiction, um, drugs, uh, as well as sex pornography and things like that. And of course, for me, around the time I started cutting was really probably about a year and a half, two years after puberty, I was kind of a late bloomer. And, uh, you know, always felt like the odd kid, never really quite f- felt like I fit in. Still don't, but I'm, I'm good with it now. You know, like, hey, whatever. It's okay um, if we don't fit in. Yeah, that's all right. I guess that's being genuine self. That's what I, mm-hmm. that's what I tell myself. So, yep. um, but yeah, so going through a lot of, of, of different pain and changes in the home, um, per my recollection at that time, my dad wasn't in the home or wasn't in the home frequently. And, and we were finally made aware that, um, our father, when I say our, I have an older brother, uh, had substance issues or that there was some issue going on. Um, seeing that my mom under a great amount of duress and stress and everything else, um, I always had a fascination with knives, still do. Ironically, I've got a, the sweatshirt I have on. We won't mention because I don't want to connect the company, but it's <laughs> it's, a, it's a knife company that I have, I think, uh, two of my knives and one of my swords with. And I remember, you know, out hacking weeds or something and I, and I cut myself. And although the pain and the blood, it was like, oh, this was painful, but I felt a sense of relief. So to so begin I, with, it was an accident. Correct. Correct. And I still have a scar somewhere on one of my casts from a pretty good, probably about maybe about an inch, if that, maybe three quarters of an inch long. So this is what I'm trying to understand. Sure. So, so you said, so you accidentally cut yourself and then you felt a sense of relief from. Yeah. I, I don't know if it was endorphins kicking in or what I, you know, I've really not dug too deep into the psychology behind it and what actually gets activated in the brain uh, because it was a short period of time for me, probably lasted two, three months. And but, I, so, but can you explain the ahead. feeling? Sure. I mean, well, anyone gets cut, you know, that there's, there's pain, right? Of there's course. pain. And I think we, so we concentrate, but to me, that would be, then you concentrate on that particular pain. Sure. And I think much like anything else, like abusing a substance or whatever it is, you, you know, you escape an emotion. It's, it's like, how many of us look to be present in moments, you know, throughout the day, I, you know, really being connected to ourselves, really right. present, not, not living in the past or the future, but actually in the moment. And there was something, the best I can equate it is, while I am in pain, I am bleeding. Nothing else was going on. I'm not, my senses aren't paying attention to any sounds outside of me. I'm not in a heightened state that I still, I still struggle with the um, hypervigilance being in, in settings, especially socially uh, or out anywhere. I'm very hypervigilant. It's just, it kicks in. It sucks. Okay. It's, you know, it's one of those fight or flight mode anxiety things. And so I think it, it, it you know, reflecting back, looking at it now as a grown man, as much as you could call me a grown man, <laughs> uh, that, that that's what it was. And whenever I, I did do any cutting, it, it you are feeling that pain. You are in that moment. And, and there almost is a, you can identify the pain as well. You know, I know this hurt to cut on my arm. Uh, I know what that, that pain is. I know where it's, I can identify this. Whereas for me at that point in my life, the pain that I was feeling emotionally that manifested physically, I couldn't identify it. I didn't understand it. Didn't have the scope coping skills. Didn't have the outlets to speak with anyone. And it's not a knock on my mom. She amazing mom mm-hmm. did the best she could, but mm-hmm. you know, her son also wasn't speaking up saying I, I'm struggling, you know? And for me, right. I saw this, my mom's burden was so much. I don't want to add more. Um, so I guess an idea, she would have said, she would have put a stop to it quickly, but she didn't, she didn't know the, the hurt and struggles and pain that I was feeling inside. Okay. So 
from what I understand, when somebody is cutting themselves, it's not supposed to be like something that's deep, that's going to kill them or anything like that. Just a slight amount of so that you got some pain to distract you from your emotional pain. Is that correct? Right. Correct. Yeah, I, I didn't use knives. I used razor blades. Uh, so it's thin. And that just gives me the willies. Simple. The, you know, you don't bleed a lot. Um, is, it, is it like paper cuts? Does it feel like that? Because those hurt. Paper cuts suck. No, they do. it was never. No, it, it, it totally different pain than a paper. Of course, paper cuts, we tend to get on our hands, which, you know, we have so many nerves and I mean, how often between our fingers and right. stuff? Right. No, the worst. Or the tip um, of the finger. Yeah. yeah. No, mine was more back and uh, my um, tricep bicep area on both my arms. So, was there was there enjoyment of actual watching that, or just as soon as that pain was there, everything else went away? It was kind of, uh, I think the latter, that the, the pain went away. It was kind of putting the hurt and the scars on the outside. I was also a kid now that I, you know, uh, most of my full arm, left arm tattooed, it, you know, was fascinated with that. It wasn't something I could do as an artistic expression or outlet, because uh, I'm kind of artsy fartsy person, um, <laughs> that it, it was almost like that, like, okay, I can decide what I look like, what I feel like. It was, I, I really think for me, a control mechanism too. Okay. That in that moment, I am the one that is in control of my pain because this person, that situation, whatever it is, is the turmoil is external of me. So it was almost looking for, I don't, I hate to use the word solution because it's not anyone listening. It is not. Right, right. Please, please ask for help if you are doing this or thinking about doing this. Um, but, I, but in my view, I think at that time, it was uh, a way to absolve that, you know, lack of control, um, feeling that so much was coming at me exterior wise, emotionally that I couldn't handle. It's like, I will take control of my pain. So, so what, from what I understand and what I'm hearing a lot from different people is that this was like a junior high age, freshman year in high school age, and then it was over with. Why do you suppose it's that age group? Hmm. I think there's a lot of change at that time. Not just with like us. going through puberty and all that. Puberty, mentally, emotionally, mm -hmm. you know, our, our, our brains are really starting to activate some new stuff that uh, probably not as easy to get alcohol or drugs. Maybe. Yeah. You think that factors in at all? You know, I don't, I, I couldn't say, I don't want to speak on that because I didn't use until my twenties. Yeah. And, you know, right. People don't believe, you know, wait, you're an alcoholic. I think, but you, I think you're like 23, weren't you? Uh, first time I got like drunk, a drunk. buzz drunk, drunk was probably 22. Yeah. Okay. But it wasn't like throwing up. It wasn't like, Oh right. my God, it was all right. I've had six beers and I'm really feeling this. Not that anyone that like, Hey, it, having six beers isn't really a, that normal people. I hate to tell you, you know? So, well, uh, yeah, but if you've not drank before and you drink six beers, you're probably going to get sick. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas by the end, it was like, oh, I had 15. Okay. You know, wouldn't yeah. know the difference. Um, that's neither here nor there. So that very well could be that there wasn't sort of substances available. Um, I, I Like I said, I know for me, there, you know, different fascinations because, you know, some cutters just cut. I put designs. Oh, um, you did? Yeah. One of them was, uh, was the, the, this changing thing of, of my initials in a logo that I've drawn 97 different times. I actually have tattooed in the center of my back. <laughs> and so it was, was in there. Uh, plus I was a, uh, on the, uh, left arm and then on my right arm, I was very much in my Edgar Allan Poe face, still one of my favorite writers. And I actually put, uh, did I put quote, I, it's faded. So I can't remember. I believe I put quote the Raven nevermore on my left arm. If I remember correctly, you actually did that. Yes. 
oh my gosh. But just with the razor, like not not with ink or anything. Nope. So nope. did you have that covered now with, with ink and actually um, put into a tattoo? My left arm is my right, not let me see. Uh, here, let me see if I can even see it anymore. It's uh, it's pretty well faded. You can't you can't see it because this camera's not zooming. Yeah, I can't but, see it. Yeah, I can't even make it out. I mean, I grew another six inches after that, I think five inches. So, it, you know, it's pretty well faded out for the most part. On my left arm, I can still see it if I look closely underneath the tattoo. It's still there. Okay. That seems like that would take a long time to do that, though. Uh, I, th I think I uh, probably planned it out and knew how it was going to look and just, you know. Put, put it in there. I, I Who knows? I, it so this kind is of like stops totally different settings. than what I've heard. You know, the time the stop kind of I've stops in those moments. I'm sorry, what? Time kind of stops in those moments. So when we are, when we go into a state of focus, think about it when you're, you're driving and you're thinking about something, you know, you're driving on autopilot. So much of our brain, 95% of it is subconscious activity right. and is conscious. And then all of a sudden you're home and you're like, boy, I don't even remember taking my exit. I, it, right. it's, your brain kind of goes, or at least mine did, I'll speak for me, went to that same kind of a place. It, who knows how long it took? I, I really couldn't tell you. I don't recollect, um, but it wasn't, uh, yeah, I, 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 who knows? So was this something that any of your friends knew that you were doing or did you totally keep it hidden? I hid it well. I hid, hid it well. well. So yeah. obviously you had to wear long sleeve shirts and all that. Well, kind of I, stuff. I did it just enough. You got to, so for my age, the very baggy clothes were popular, like okay. the hip hop culture. I was into that way of dressing. So I had, you know, my short sleeves went down to my elbows. So I, you know, it was enough, enough to hide it. And I, you know, I did cut on my back a couple of times if I recollect co correctly, but um, yeah, it was easy to hide. It was very well, easy to hide. And, and I was going to ask, how the heck do you do it on your back? But I don't want to give anybody any ideas. <laughs> That's one thing we're going to put a disclaimer on here. We're not like trying to give people ideas on how to do this. We're trying to like, don't do it. Yeah, well, and I it, I don't mind sharing because hopefully if somebody's listening and maybe their child and they're, they're wondering if their child is going through this. These are some of the good signs to look forward and that's what they, I wanted to talk about. Yeah, too. it is. It is areas from my knowledge uh, that people tend to to hide for sure. Um, and, and yeah, that was my intent. I didn't want to let anybody else know. I didn't, you know, I didn't want to be a burden. That was a big um, self-perception of mine, of, mm -hmm. of that I was a burden. And I didn't want to bring more burden on those that I love, that I always saw, that I already saw a burden. Again, my misperception not reality right so this went on for how many years three no uh you nailed it it was per my recollection freshman year maybe over the course of three or four months okay and yeah. then like you just quit i did i did so did uh, you I, replace it with something else at the time or you just quit? Uh, yeah, I think at that point, you know, I started to discover my body and being that I went through the sexual abuse that went on to masturbation and those things and stuff like that, that that is an area I've definitely done more work on, okay. um, you know, so yeah, kind of went in that direction. So it's probably not as big as deal as I think it is, except that it's scary to me especially at that age, because there's so many emotions going all over the place, even if you don't have childhood traumas, you know, and that kind of stuff, but just, just that age period, when you've got all those hormones going everywhere, and you don't know who you are, or, or you know, all that kind of stuff. And if somebody used that, um, like, what if they didn't know what they were doing? I mean, they, I, there's probably I haven't done the studies behind it, but there's probably people that have led to that. Oh, I, I I agree, and it is a big deal because it's an indicator for sure of something deeper going right. on, no matter what. Right. It, it could be chemical imbalance, it could be trauma-based stuff. 
you know, there's a multitude of possibilities and combinations that are there. And, and I'm sure I know there's people that for them, it was forearm stuff. And as we know, Hey, where, where we get our shots and everything, right. you know, it's all there that, you know, many people have unfortunately taken their lives in that cutting in that area. So, uh, you know, if you are someone that is struggling, I know, you know, I don't know the listenership or you someone you know you love or they have expressed it really it it's a cry for help much like anything else and if they're letting you know and i know a lot of people you know you might get that i'm telling you and trust please don't tell anyone yeah you can't do that you, so you the gotta, most of my listenership help. is women mm-hmm. in in between 30 and 45 but i'm sure they have kids yeah you know and i guess that's who we need to talk to then is the parents and what signs to look for so i'm I'm gonna say one thing i got a tattoo when i was not of age to do that Um, but it was a group of us cheerleaders and we just we had won this big competition and we were all spending the night at one place and we found a guy that would take our he knew we were baking the parent signature and we all just got this very tiny tattoo on our hip of a heart that's it but we all got the same thing so there was eight of us and i i remember thinking i gotta hide my mom would just (laughs) she would have fits if i had a tattoo but it wasn't anything that would ever be showing really you know what i'm saying um i think i was only two weeks into having it um so we had three bathrooms in our house three full baths and i was you know taking a shower or whatever and my mom knocked on the door and she said i really need to get in there the other two bathrooms are full and so i had to let her in never even thought about that on my hip you know by now it you know I could take the bandage off you know and right. um, never even thought about it and so like I unlocked the door but then I jumped back in the shower still again not thinking about that tattoo and she was so she she got done doing what she had to do but she started plucking her eyebrows in the mirror of course it's two women you know, so it doesn't matter. I get out, you know, and I've got my towel on and stuff and I'm drying off and she sees it. Oh Lord. I know. And she's like, Christine. That's what <laughs> I get called when I'm in trouble. <laughs> Christine. And I'm like, what? And when, you know, when she, what, what, how did you do that? You're not old enough to do that. You didn't get my permission. You have to have my permission. And she just went off on me and I actually started laughing going, well, what are we going to do about it now? Like, like, seriously, are you going to ground me the rest of my life? It's not going to take the tattoo away. Right. You know? And I was like, it's look, look at it. It's actually kind of pretty and it's little, it's not like it's going to show all over me because she was always, she always talked to my brothers about someday you're going to have a job and there's going to be places that won't hire you if that's showing yeah you know and i think that's still true but not as much um but back then you know more some yeah yeah and anyway i said but nobody's nobody's gonna see that unless they see me naked and i don't plan on anybody seeing me naked but long story short i you know she did notice but i don't think she would have noticed had that situation been there so what i'm asking you then is how do we tell parents to look? I mean, like you were raised with your mom. Your mom's not going to walk in when you're in high school in the shower, you yeah. know, when you're taking a shower. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, most normal homes, you wouldn't, a mother wouldn't. We yeah. know that we're not supposed to do that. <laughs> At boundaries, people. Huh? Sure. Um, I, I, you know, I think it's look for any other indicators no different than than substance abuse or you're not probably not really in a very few teenagers are yet in the phase of abuse very few kick right off and it's like whoa it's crazy um but look for a lot of those patterns the the depression the withdraw 
uh, especially if they're social people to begin with. Mm -hmm. I definitely had friends that were that, that were social and started to withdraw because of things going on at home or, um, you know, it started drinking in high school and kind of aging myself, you know, and I mean, I'm going to be 44, like getting any hardcore drugs where I grew up. And when I say hardcore, they're all hardcore. Let's be honest. Sure. Alcohol, the most hardcore drug on the planet. Absolutely. Uh, but y you you have to really see any of those changes and, and be communicative. If you're setting up, I think the relationship right with your children, especially it's hard. I don't know about you. And I struggle with this, not so much as with my son as I do my daughter, but I, I, I got to remember. And I tell myself in my head, you are not her friend, right? You're not and that's her friend. Hard to do. And it is, oh gosh. Yeah. My daughter and I incredibly close, like, you know, and I am with my son as well, but he's got Asperger's autism spectrum. So it's, it's, it can be a little bit more of a challenge at times. Um, but having that communication and asking questions, you know, that I probably maybe would have helped me at that time. Um, you know, I, I try to cut my mom slack in the sense of, you know, again, my mom, amazing mom, but you know, young, my parents were young when they had my brother and I, and they didn't come from the most emotionally mature people either. And I love my grandparents, but it was, you know, it was yelling and, you know, it was that kind of thing. And you get out the belt to keep you in line. So, you know, my parents were definitely a step in the evolution of being more emotionally mature with their kids, uh, I would say. But we got to talk to them. We got to talk to our kids. We got to get them to, to know that they are in a safe place to open up to us if they are struggling. And I think the earlier you can start that dialogue of, of being there and making sure you're a good sounding board and listen um, while supporting their independence at the same time, the, 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 the more of a chance that they're going to open up to you and come to you, mm -hmm. you know, I, I I think that's where our bonds are made with people is when we're in a, a safe place of non-judgment. And even though they might disagree or there's disappointment, um, but you know, you're still safe, you know, m emotionally and physically. So, you know, I, you, you hit the nail on the head with not being their friend and my first child, I, I don't know if I ever brought it up in one of my podcasts, but I, my husband was an iron worker and he fell off the bridge and, and he died and she was like 10. Um, so I, it was just me and her. And I didn't plan on getting in another relationship anytime soon. And I just wanted to get her through the trauma of losing her father and myself. Um, and we, we were very, very close. And her freshman year in high school, she tried to commit suicide. Yeah. And we had a very close relationship. I thought I knew everything that was going on. I didn't see any signs of depression. And you have to remember, I got my degree in psychology and I knew all the things to look for, okay? Um, thankfully, and this was, I mean, I shouldn't say that like she tried, had I not, and I don't know if it was a higher power or what it was, because I left work early that day and I got home and she should have been around doing homework and whatever. And I, you know, she wasn't in her normal spot. So I went up in her bedroom and she literally um, had taken a whole bottle of pills and was totally unconscious and like very much of a very little pulse. So she wasn't like, crying out for help. She was like doing it. Okay. Um, I, I threw her over my shoulder and took her. We, we lived like not even three minutes from the hospital. So I felt like it was quicker for me to do that than to call an ambulance and wait. Absolutely. And so that's what I did, but I did call them on my way, tell them I was there, you know, on my way. And this is what was going on. And but it was too late to pump her stomach. They tried the charcoal stuff um, and it didn't work. And so like, they seriously did not think she would make it through the night. They said, all we can do now is wait. So we were in ICU. Um, 
She woke up several times, but she was not the person that I ever knew. She would yell and cuss and scream and then pass back out. And it was like on and off like that all night long. But she obviously made it through it. And then at that time, if you ever tried to take your life, that that's actually against the law. It was. And you have to go into treatment. Like you don't get to leave the hospital. So she was put on the juvenile psychiatric ward. Um, I was told the next day when I went up to see her. So I went home and had to get some sleep because I was awake all night long. I didn't know if I was going to have my daughter. Um, I went home to take a shower, get a couple hours of sleep. They said they had to do all this paperwork and she had to see her counselor and all this and that and the other. So they said to give, give her at least six hours. Um, when I came back, the psychiatrist on the ward that was dealing with them, her, um, came to me and said, um, I'm not going to allow you two to see each other this week. Hmm. I'm like, what? I, I need to see my daughter. He said, um, she doesn't want to see you. She's not comfortable. And I need her to be comfortable with me. That was so hard. So hard. Then when he finally was, you know, got like four or five days with her and he called me in to talk to him personally, he said, one of the biggest problems going on here is you're being her friend. Mm. And I said, what do you mean? He said, she knows way too, she shouldn't know your financial situation. She shouldn't, she shouldn't know any of your personal stuff you're going through. She's a kid. Yeah. You know, we shared everything. I had no idea. Like it was wrong. Like if I said, Hey, you know, I'm running short this week, so we can't get this, but I'll get it to you next week. I didn't think that was wrong. Sure. Um, I was so hurt, so embarrassed. I'm so glad that I learned it though, because I got the chance to have a second child and know better, but it's still hard. Yeah. It is very hard to know where that fine line is of being their friend. And, and of course my son, I'm like a little bit harder on because <laughs> I, you know, have been there. I'm a little more afraid, you know, I mean, like her, there was absolutely no signs whatsoever. Like sure. she, she was, I, I was with her every night and she, her moods never switched, you know, there was no sign whatsoever. Yeah. And it, it's tough because we're good at hiding. I mean, you're talking to a guy right now that is in the midst of an anxiety attack that's been going for two hours. So, you know, we, we kind of can do a good job of hiding these things. Right uh, now you have been? Yeah. Well, it's settled once we started talking, but yeah, I've been having waves of anxiety. So, um, oh, it's okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. It's just something I, you know what? And I've had it, you know, my sponsor and other people, you know, because I had had a pretty good stint of sobriety and then fallen off mm -hmm. the, just over 14 months ago now, 14 months, two days and whatever hours um, that is common. And, and I really think I've had it since I was a kid, just didn't understand that, um, you know, thus going back to the cutting, I think it was an escape from that anxiety as well, you know, so um but so you we, think you've always had anxiety? I believe probably since around puberty. I def depression for sure. Uh, I depression for sure, and it can have the same face and same attitude and speech that I'm having with you right now too. When I'm mm -hmm. in a state of depression, I'm, mm -hmm. you know, people think depression is you're always under the blankets and you don't get up and want to go. And and yes, that's true. That's and depending upon it. the person, but for me, not always, not always. So. Um, yeah, it's so tough. Gosh, now I'm just my heart. I just want to give your daughter a hug and just be like, it's it's okay. I know. And, we'll, and you know, so she's older now and married. And um, you know, she actually talks to my son about it because she knows how worried I am if if he like quits talking. And because there's so many years in difference of age, um, you know, she's like appreciative of how I raised her and she, she does not blame me in any way, nor does 
she knows what the psychiatrist said as far as I was being her friend. She, to her, that wasn't any part of what was going on with her. It was actually her age and her changing and a guy that was using her. Uh. And, and she admitted that over and over and over again to him, to the psychiatrist, but he kept saying, you know, your, your mom should have seen this. Your mom should have known this. She did talk to me about what was going on with this guy. And I did give her, you know, and I even said, if this keeps up, then I'm going to make you not be able to see him whatsoever because he's damaging. You know, I did all those things, but apparently I was sharing too much of my life with her, like what I was going through when I was a teenager, I was trying to compare it. So she knew I understood right what i was doing right so she but so she talks to my son now um when i get worried you know because he's quiet or something you know because if i say something oh you you know how's it going what's going on and like mom i'm i'm not my sister you don't have to worry about me (laughs) and he kind of gets upset about it yeah well you know what young dudes we can be that way and kind of you know um hopefully we continue to evolve that that i think one of the worst things for men is be it internally or the environments that we are in to hide our emotions um because i know for me encountering it was fine when i was joyous and when i was angry but uh, as much as anger wasn't liked all right, he's a guy, he can be, you know, get angry or whatever, you know, no, we, we, we have the same spectrum of emotions as, as any other human on this planet. And I, hopefully we become more evolved and more mature that, you know, I'll, I'll look at my girlfriend now and just go, I'm having an off day. I'm having self doubt or, you know, I'm down on myself. The, you know, the, the taboo things that a guy just doesn't say, or, I feel insecure about my body or, uh, you know, sexually, I'm not confident right now. Can we have a conversation about our intimacy? Cause I want to make sure that I'm a good partner to you or whatever it is. You know, these are all examples to, to, that we, you know, we got to put out there. Um, I think for men to be, you know, good about coming and communicating. So we understand not only ourselves, but how to talk with our partners, our families, our work environments, our friends, and so on. So I want to ask you then when, so when you talk to your girlfriend about that, are you expecting an help from her or do you just want her to listen? Definitely listen, listen. Uh, I, that's a big part of building intimacy. You know, it, it's so important to own our own emotions, mm-hmm. you know, to be like, you know, ah, I'm just, I'm, I'm grumpy, you know, and it's okay to be like, can, can I, I'm a guy that I have to reflect so that I don't say a bunch of bullshit because I am a talker mm-hmm. that's not factual to what is actually going, you know, can I have a little space right now? I'm going to go out to the, to the garage or I'm going to, I don't know, edit something or whatever it is, what, whatever task that I got to do. I love to build Legos. Yeah. Like I said, I'm not that grown up. Um, just to kind of get my mind in a place of working and it calming down to where I can go, you know what, you know what I'm feeling like, <sighs> you, I'm not bringing home as much money as I can. I'm not feeling like a good provider. That's making me feel really insecure or whatever it may be. I mean, so something just, like that though, what's a good answer for you? Uh, if I'm able to talk with her and just put it out there and let her know whatever is going on with me is an mm-hmm. inside problem, not an outside problem. It's not something that her, the kids or anybody can fix. Yeah. It's, it's, it's my emotion and I have to own them. And, and I've gotten pretty good about that over the last couple of years, just saying, these are my feelings. This is what I'm feeling. It has no reflection on you, nor is it anyone's responsibility, but myself, because there are my emotions uh to solve them but it helps to have someone to be able to lean on and have a sounding board and to be that in return so then on the other side of that how do we how do we know unless you tell us whether you're actually seeking for advice or help or if you're just wanting us to listen here's the trick guys or or ladies listening Mm -hmm. 
We need to be mature enough. And when I say we, us, the individual to tell our significant other or whomever we're talking Thank to, you. that that's what it is. Thank don't you. make them guess. Don't, don't have anyone live in your unreasonable mindset. Uh, the worst thing you can think was if you knew me, well, then you would know bullshit. No, they don't. You don't even understand you at that moment. So don't put it on someone else to solve it for you. Tell them. I, I, right now, could you, could you just please listen? Um, or can you give me some advice on this? This is what I'm struggling with or what's confused. You have to make it clear, communicate that clearly. And what's confusing about that is a person that's really hiding it good can say there you're looking too much. There isn't anything. Sure. But when there really is. Sure. So it's it's a difficult situation. Now I just hey, what again, do you think hides be what what it is? I know for me when I've said that it's it's two things: guilt and shame that mm -hmm. I'm hiding behind mm -hmm. when I don't want to communicate. What do you think in your experience? Um, I think it's guilt and yeah, shame, shame that that person's going to have to admit that they're going through something and they don't want to admit it sure. or that you will judge them. I think it's more of a, you know, that type of thing where I don't want to be judged. I don't want you to think I'm weak. I, you know, yeah. all those things, which are in their mind, not necessarily what we're making you feel like, you know, or even trying to, but um, I've, I've seen that in my own son and, you know, it's just what, what he's been going through just in the, lately so i'm checking on him but not checking on him so just hey why don't we spend some time together and watch a movie yeah and in doing that just lately he's been telling me that his um i i said how are you doing with your breakup and he said so i sat down and i did a plan now this is all on his own i sat down i did a plan and i'm just going to really dive into my um, homework, making sure that I'm carrying my A's and keeping my scholarship and I'm working out and he's working out seven days a week, which is too much. <laughs> well, and I'm saying that because he works out three hours a day and he's oh. getting back aches and leg cramps and all that stuff, but he's pushing all that into that. Okay. So this is the scenario. So we're watching this movie and he keeps going like this, like, you know, his back's hurting. And we've got one of those roller things, which you do when you meditate, not meditate, but like yoga, whatever. They're good things to stretch your backs out and stuff. And I said, why don't you use the roller thing? Well, you know, why we're watching this movie. And so he started using that. He did have a shirt off, so I know he wasn't cutting or anything. <laughs> <laughs> um unless he did it Thank on his goodness. legs <laughs> but uh anyway so he he did that for a little bit and then he like he was sitting at the edge of the bed towards the tv and he said um i'm kind of nauseous hmm. and i said oh have you had anything to eat yeah he, i think it might be for my back i said okay so we've got a vibrator thing that looks like a drill they're they're new out yeah i know we got one as well i know it's yeah tough. and it's got all these different attachments to it and stuff yeah. that thing will pound out a knot I'll tell no you. kidding so i said why don't you get that and you tell me you know where it's hurting and you know i'll do that while we're watching this so he's like it's okay and but yet he kept you know making the movements and making his groans and going I don't know what to do. And, you know, when this movie's over, I'm going to have to do this and after that, but my back hurts. I'm like, just try taking any Tylenol. No. How about if I get some ice packs? Eh. <laughs> Everything that I offered, there was no answer. There, in other words, he, there was nothing that I could do. Okay. And so then I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm out of ways to do something. Do you just want to complain? and me be quiet and he got up and walked out of the room <laughs> <laughs> like, okay i can't win this one so i just need to leave it be 
I, yeah. I just need to leave it be. And like an hour later, he calls me because he, he went to work out and he calls me and he's like, hey, I just wanted to let you know that, you know, I went and worked out and thanks for doing the movie with me and I feel better now. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's another thing too, uh, men, when you, when you need silence now, not in all situations, obviously, if you're having a discussion, especially your significant other, it's not the motor, you know, I need silence. But let that known too. really anyone. I mean, you know, uh, my significant other, she needs she likes alone time. You know, we we don't have a huge house, not a little house, but we do a good job of giving each other space no matter what. It's like anyone, if you just need space in your time, your alone time, it's it's okay to go, you know, whatever it is. So. okay, so getting so we'll finish up with this cutting thing. So. Like I said, you know, here he is, he's got his shirt off and everything, but think about this. I mean, it's, they have, every state has their law now where at a certain age, like a mother and a son can't sleep in the same bed together. They can't, you know, you can't, your son's not supposed to walk around, you know, naked or you're not, you know, or the mother or whatever. I mean, you can get called in for that. So, I'm both detrimental things psychologically. So, and they are, they yeah. are, you know, so I'm, I'm not complaining about, it, but I'm saying, so how would we, besides, you know, you did say you had some suggestions about, you know, being withdrawn or changing their behavior, that kind of stuff. But if we can't see something physically and they're not talking, I guess we're, I mean, is it, is there I'm wrong to say, look, I'm really worried. Um, I don't think so. I don't you as a parent that at any point, hey, I, you know, I, I'm just concerned. And, and I, I, I know for me, I have moments where I, you know, let both my kids know, like, hey, how's everything going? And sometimes I don't want to converse. So I'm like, look, I want you to know and remind them, look, I'm here. If there's ever anything you need to talk about, please, you know, I'm available but, you know, let, let's talk, let's have the conversation. And I think that that's sometimes the best we can do, you know, letting them know that we, we are available, that it's a, it's a two-way street and um, that it's a safe haven, but you got to be able as a parent too, to put yourself in that place. Mm -hmm. You got to really take a look in the mirror and, and, and I, and I'm just speaking from experience ago, okay, I have to put my mature hat on here and lose judgment and sit and listen and ask them as well. Is this a listening situation? Or is this a, you want feedback? Because I tend to be, especially with my daughter, too much more of the feedback than the <laughs> listening. Uh, so it's a, it's a new skill that I got to take. And I remind them, you know, both Hey, I'm human too. I make mistakes. Um, but just like, you know, you're, you're 13 and 12, I'm only 13 years old as a parent, you know? So right. I'm still a new growing experience for me. I've never had teenagers before. I've only been one. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's got its challenges in, in that regard, but I wait until they hit 18 to 20 and they know absolutely everything <laughs> in life. I think my daughter's already there. Christy. Is she there? Well, um, and girls do mature faster than boys, but oh yes, absolutely. Let me tell you, and it's like you know what? How old are you? Are we not still learning every day something? Every day, and we have to. And, the, and that's what I've said. I'm like, you know what? You can you can think you know everything right now at my age, and I've lived twice as long as you have. I don't know everything. I learn <laughs> every single day. You can't possibly know everything. Uh, no, no, but that's what, what keeps it, uh, keeps it going. People that, it, you know, when I hear the boredom word, I, I'm like, how in this lifetime, look back at all the brilliant minds and things that, are, that have occurred that are just through curiosity that in this day and age, when we used to have to get the, the dictionary, the encyclopedia and the, uh, oh, what was the other, um, thesaurus or whatever it was. So the encyclopedia, the, some and through it. That one? Yes, yeah, encyclopedia. Yeah, the encyclopedia, dictionary, thesaurus, uh, National Geographic, whatever. What you can just go. I want to know 
I'm curious about uh, how bridges are built. Boom, there you go. You look and and it's there. Like so much stuff is so Which at is, our fingertips. That's scary though too, because you sure. can also look up on there how to get rid of yourself. Yeah. All the different ways. And that scares me. So that's the other thing I wanted to bring up to parents. Okay. Um, is that maybe it feels like you're in bait, in baiting in their privacy, but I think sometimes we have to. Mm -hmm. um and we have to put those boundaries in so yeah. like snapchat oh gosh that's a biggie because things go away and they don't and, and, and they don't because you know people can screenshot that stuff and so there's they, a lot of they can there. but what i'm saying is that like as a parent you can go back in and you can't see what was put in sure you know gotcha. um i actually took it away um, from mine, but that didn't mean anything. I mean, as soon as I was away, they just reinstalled it, you know? Yeah. So, um, but yes, you need to keep checking on that kind of stuff. And maybe it is an invasion of privacy, but you're their parent. And mm -hmm. I think we have that right to keep an eye on them. Do we, do we need to give them some privacy? Yes, but we have to consider the age, what's going on. There's so many factors in that. I don't apologize for checking in. No. You know, even if they uh -huh. get mad, I'm like, you know what? I'm being a parent. Yeah. And I love you and I want to make sure you're okay. And this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. What is that saying? If your kids don't get mad at you, you're not doing it right. Yep. Yep. So, so you know. but you know, it's hard when they're mad at you. It you know? is. It, it's hard, but you got to do it. And you have to realize that at some point in time, they're going to grow up and they're going to be thankful that you were that way. Yeah. It's hard I, at the I time. Know I, was. <laughs> I know I was. Uh, so, sure. okay. So I hope that we've covered enough that parents, please, please, please just check on your kids. Um, and then I don't, I have not heard of an adult cutting. I'm not that I'm aware of. And I think maybe you nailed it. Is it at that, that age, you know, different substances kind of did become available. Aren't as available. Yeah. I mean, if you talk to, uh, you know, one of the, uh, ironically is thinking he's the coolest guy on the planet. And then now as an adult, he's sober, Nikki six, a Motley crew, you know, he, he, his book outlays out of the pain of, you know, he was injecting heroin. It's not a unpainful process um, right. much like how we discussed the cutting it's mm -hmm. it's a painful process at the end there is that same kind of relief so i think it falls under whatever reactions are happening in the brain that there is a very a similarity there so i would just encourage having a conversation about it all i talked to my kids about fentanyl you know when you mentioned snapchat that's the first thing i thought uh -huh. you know one of the organizations i'm working with that is yeah. our primary education area of education, the fentanyl crisis here in the Central Valley in California. That is our number one thing that, that we discuss in addition to every other substance. Can you tell the audience what that is? Uh, the fentanyl? name of the company? No, the name oh. of the company. Yeah, it's called Pain, Parents and Addicts in Need. Okay. And it's pr you probably does. Is, is that just for that area in California? Correct. We, as of now, we are just in uh, central California. We're looking to try to uh, go all, all the way up to Sacramento and conversations, I believe, have started possibly with Washington. Uh, okay. Great organization. Oh. Got a governor's award, a 2021 nonprofit of the year award. So oh, I love that. Um, yeah, it's a wonderful organization. Real honor to be a part of. Okay. So I guess we're going to have to know what to look up then whatever area we're th that we're in. Sure. So um, but maybe reach out. there's plenty of resources and it should be in every state that, that I, again, I don't want to speak out of turn. I don't know the level of education depending upon the state uh, and their type of funding, but you know, all these things, there is education out there for it and the discussions have to happen. They, they do. I know Absolutely. it's uncomfortable, but but they do because it's going to be a hell of a lot more comfortable if uh, Johnny or Susie is no longer there. And believe me, I know that feeling. That broke my heart when you shared that. I did not um, know 
about your daughter. You can't even, and you know what? Thankfully, I had my mother. Um, there's a lot of people at my age at that time would not have told their mom. And I mm -hmm. called my mom immediately and I said, I need you here with me. And there was not embarrassment there. First of all, I didn't feel like I did anything. Um, sure. I just, I needed her there. I was all by myself. Didn't know if I was going to lose my daughter or not. And she and my daughter were very close. Um, I was embarrassed at first when my daughter was screaming, like she was using the F bomb left and right. And she never, I never heard that word come out of her mouth ever. And it, and the eyes, it was like, she had the devil in her. It was awful, awful. And she would look at, look at her grandma like that and say, who the F are you? What are you doing there? Like she had no idea what she did. Sure. And, you know, my mom had to go through that too. And yeah. she sat there and she held my hand and, you know, we prayed together. And um, so if you have to go through something like that, I, I want to also encourage you guys to go to your parents if they're still alive, you know, or your spouse, your best friend, whoever it is, but have somebody with you too. Yeah. That can yeah. support you and help you through it because it's how yeah. it is absolute how yep. um, but i am glad to this day that she survived and that i learned some lessons out of it like not sharing everything not being yeah. their best friend when you you nailed that one not being their best yeah. friend i don't think we realize we're doing that no, I, I don't think so either. I mean, there, you know, and there's that term uh, emotional incest that, that it can go to so many varying degrees, um, you know, that it's, yeah, I, I think it's, it's such a, you know, your line knowing you was, uh, you know, I want my daughter to understand what's going on. You weren't looking for, for her like a emotional support. Yeah, like answer. I didn't talk to her about, oh, I had this date last night and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And this is, yeah. I, I didn't do that. Mine, mine was, and that's why I was so confused. I'm like, sure. okay, I think I need to tell my child why she can't have something this week. And there's nothing yeah. embarrassing about it. I'll get my check next week and we can do it then. But, you know, there was more bills this week. I don't see a problem with that. I still don't. I think that guy was maybe the, that doctor a little bit off because Thank you. yeah, you, I, I, those are, those are real life situations that they're going, your kids are going to go through and be yeah. faced with financial stuff and they need to understand it's part of a budget. We actually even share the, the budget with our kids to help them understand and why certain money goes to certain places, you know, X amount goes towards, uh, a rainy day fund, you know, if jobs are lost and we've got to cover right. three to six months of income, if a major, you know, a car issue comes up or whatever. So we're not going into credit or, you know, where we're paying nearly 30% on, you know, a car repair, you know, so we have those kind or no, our food budget for the week is $200 or whatever it is. And I think to me, that's all also teaching sure. them things down the road in life that they're going to have to go through. absolutely because financial that's why, literacy yeah. is in abundance and that's in why i was like what the heck i'm not going into personal details about myself with her right but i'm teaching her that these are things that are going to come up in life and it's okay and you know but we'll take care of it next week or you know i didn't think i was putting trauma on her or too much on her or or asking her to take care of the problem <laughs> right i think it, you know you sharing it, it was a, an abusive relationship and i'm going to guess that individual took a lot of self-worth from her especially at a time we're so confused and our self-esteem is so fragile let alone losing her father all that coupled to it and wanting to have a male connection of some kind or whatever it may i I don't think it was your conversations. With well, let me tell you real fast before we ended the ending of that traumatic event. So when she was released, I still believed, and I was mad because the, that psychiatrist allowed that boyfriend to come up to see her and not me. Oh, wow. Because he was putting it on me. Um, oh, wow. And he, but and that boyfriend walked by me 
and said, ha ha, I get to see her, you don't. He was a huh. jerk, okay? When she got out of the hospital, okay, she's 13 years old. That is my responsibility, okay? Now, there was no DCF called in. There was nothing like that. Nobody thought I did anything wrong, you know, to cause this, except for the psychiatrist. <laughs> but at any rate, when we got home, he started calling right away and he wanted to come over. And I said to her, no, I think you need to take a break from that. And I really believe that this is coming from something that he's saying or doing. And I think we need to do some more talking about that because none of that was brought up with the psychiatrist. So um, it ended up, she went back to school and I guess he told all the kids at school that she tried to commit suicide. And so then she was bullied a lot and she was made fun of a lot and she got kicked out of cheerleading. And there was a bunch of stuff that happened. And I said, you know what? I think I'm just going to pay tuition and move you to another school and, and give you a fresh start. So she was away from all of that. And she was willing to do that. So it must not have been too bad because she didn't put up a fight. And I put her in another school and she did fantastic. She made new friends, her whole life changed. But let me tell you, her sophomore year in college, she came home for the weekend and she's home. And all of a sudden there's this knock on the door and I answer the door and it's this boyfriend from freshman year in high school. And he, he said, is Rochelle home? Like, and I'm like, what are you doing here? And he said, I need to make an apology to her and to you. Oh, thank goodness. And I said, okay, well, you can make it to me first and then I'll see if she would like to see you. Because during that interim, she had on her own in growing, figured out how much distance he was causing between her and I mm. um, in those years and all the things that he had been saying to her. He was like comparing, he wanted her to have sex with him and she wouldn't. And he was saying, but we're alike. We both lost our father. And so we're bonded now and doing all this crazy stuff. Yeah. But he became a minister. <laughs> He became well, a minister and so he shows up at our house and he wants to apologize and i said to him i'll accept your apology but that's her choice now i mean you know she was 20 and uh, i brought her out and she took one look at him and she said what are you doing here and he said well i came to apologize and she said go on your way you caused way too much pain in my life yeah and i was like mm, you can still accept his apology and she said i'm not ready to yeah um, and so he had to accept that. Now she did later on a couple of years later, but so I'm just saying I was, I did hit it on the nail. <laughs> um, and the psychiatrist did. And so you, you also got to figure out sometimes if you get your children or yourself in counseling, if that person's right for you or not too. Absolutely. That's so important. So, and I didn't, you know, I thought, he was a professional and he knew what he was doing, but yet it felt, it didn't feel good to me. Sure. So Absolutely. I think we need to go on our instincts too. What do you think? I, I agree. That? I agree. I think in lots of situations, especially, you know, you knew your daughter. Especially <laughs> if you're a parent that pays attention to your child, you should know Absolutely. a lot about him. And, and so let's start with that. Pay attention to your child, get to know your child, yep. even if it's behind the scenes. Sure. You know, we get to, we get to get to know them quicker than they'll get to know us. And I just know mm -hmm. that from the fortune my dad's been sober over 20 years. My parents are still married, but now, you know, I didn't get close to my dad until my mid twenties. So, you know, and now we're incredibly close. So it's uh, yeah, it's an interesting process where it is, isn't it? But it, it's, it's such an, a, a brilliant part of the human experience we have when we choose get to be the honor of being a parent and the responsibility. How things change. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know what? I think I've probably cried more as being a parent than ever. 
Uh, not in front of them most I mean I cry and not that I don't cry in front of them if we've you know we've we've had a lot of losses like everybody else has in the past several years um so not that kind of but you know when I worry about my son and you know or I worried about my daughter I I didn't want to always cry in front of them and make them think I was weak because my my cry when I was crying it was out of pain for them yeah and, and something that I couldn't take away from them, that yeah. they had to deal with, they, yeah. you know, they had to experience it's part of life. Yeah. So that was behind closed doors. But man, did I do a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not ashamed of that. I'm not ashamed of that. You know, I needed, I needed to let that out too. Um, but that wasn't hiding from them that I had emotions. That was, I don't need to let them Think that they're causing me because they were already in the situation you know sure. they don't need to think oh my gosh now i'm hurting my mom and yeah. feel worse you yeah. know absolutely they know now well yeah. one of them does the older one knows she knows now um and she will she will call me and check on me and say are you okay i know what kind of pain you're going through now <laughs> because i caused that with you uh, and i said well you didn't cause it it's part of being a parent. Yeah. We yeah. care about you. You know, we we feel we hurt when you hurt. Absolutely. If we're a good parent anyway. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, but Jason, it has been a pleasure. Again. Oh, thank you. Always a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much. And keep doing what you're doing. You do an amazing job. Oh, thank you. That means a lot. It it really does. I and you know, I'm probably one of your best followers. <laughs> so I don't miss any of them. I try to try to keep up what you got going on. I know. You know I know. You know, it's hard. Some of my friends coming up, so I'm looking forward to hearing the conversation. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate you sharing that. You know, I I like that because we have different audiences. Yes. You know, so we're going to have different listeners, and and it doesn't hurt somebody to you know. I try to take a different thing than approach than what you do so there's different aspects of sure. it oh yeah um, well different I think we all should help each other I yeah, mean the more we get those messages out there you absolutely. know so absolutely. I appreciate what you do and like, how much you share likewise thank you well thank you so much and we'll see you on another podcast or well I'll hear you anyway <laughs> sounds great thank all you right. thanks